What's going on, everybody? Welcome back into the channel. Today, I'm going to be going over my experiences playing in the Planetary Qualifier in Greenville, South Carolina. Shout out to Borderlands Comics and Games for putting on a great showing. Uh, they ran a really good event, pretty much flawless. It was awesome. It was great to be a part of it. I finished in the top four with my Sabine Green list. You're seeing here there is a little bit of a change and i'll kind of go over that when we're going to be going over lists before we get into the deck list and everything like that i do want to talk about uh stay tuned to the end of the video there's going to be a giveaway announcement there's also going to be announcements about myrtle beach games um pre-release event so definitely check that out hope to see you guys there i'll be talking about that at the end of the video uh so if you want to skip to that stuff i understand first thing i want to talk about obviously is the top eight Right. And the top eight is interesting because you don't see many Sabines and Boba Fett's. Now, I I did play Sabine and I understand people are like, oh, you only played Sabine. So that's why you're in the top eight. But I'll kind of talk about my experiences because it was an unconventional way to get there. And I think that, you know, I proved that, you know, you have to kind of go through adversity, adversity and kind of get to that point and prove that you can play your deck to obviously get into the top eight. Right. But first place was Boss Blue. Uh, he you know, control boss, really good. Being able to heal a ton of HP off pop target and boss, really solid. Palpatine yellow, shout outs to you. Uh, very unique to see him here, but he does have a good matchup into Boba Fett. So it's a little bit understanding to see Palp yellow finish in second place. Luke Tarkintown finished in third place. Again, maybe a little bit unconventional, but has pretty decent matchups into Sabine and uh, Boba Fett. So again, you see Luke here. Uh, fourth place was actually one of the Ray Tarkintowns. Again, another deck that has a pretty good matchup into Sabine. I wouldn't say it's like extremely fantastic, but it, it does do pretty good against Sabine. It's actually the deck that I did end up losing to. I lost to the guy who came in seventh place with Ray Tarkintown uh, in the top four, but still Ray Tarkintown, you're seeing it pop up a lot more because it has pretty good matchups into the meta, right? Uh, both at Tarkintown, both at Tarkintown, you know what it is. Uh, Sabine ECL came in sixth place. That's me. Um, and then you had Ray Tarkintown, and then Cura Green finishing off the list. We all know how good Cura Green is. So another thing I want to talk about is that the top six players were six and one, right? So for me, that's that's pretty cool. I did have to play the six and O oh player who was Boss Blue in the final round to make it so I can make it in. I, I lost round one. And I basically had to go undefeated to make sure I had even a chance to get in the top eight. So again, that's a little bit rough when you lose round one, but just stay a little bit calm. I had a really good support group. Uh, first of all, I just got married uh, two weeks ago. Uh, called my wife. She kind of was like, hey, don't worry about it. Just play good. Uh, I had a group chat going on and then two buddies at the event as well. I talked to who kind of kept me even keel. So shout out to all you guys. It was really awesome. But still, uh, again, you're looking at the six and ones from first to sixth place. And then the person who came in first place in the whole tournament, right? They ended up winning the whole thing. Seventh place played Ray red. Uh, they were five and two and same thing with, um, the eighth place guy five and two. So now you kind of have to see losing round one and you're going to see my winning percentages for my opponents. Right? I'm just going to kind of show this to you guys because I lost in round one and that guy ended up dropping i then had to play someone who lost in round one in round two who also ended up dropping so the percentages were really against me from there and then i kind of had to get the ball rolling the two and one uh player i ended up you know beating them again i think that they might have dropped as well after i beat them so if you lose round one, you're at a really big disadvantage because a lot of the players that you end up playing do end up dropping. But then you start to get to round four, five, six. That's when you're starting to play against people who are not going to drop, who have good records, and you have to kind of prove it there, right? So your your next two rounds are kind of iffy with your opponents, and then you get into the really like the sweaty games. Like you have to like really give it your all and play really well because these are the guys who have still really good records who probably didn't lose round one and kind of go from there, right? So let's go over my list and kind of why I kind of, this is not my exact list from the tournament. This is what I would bring going forward, right? So instead of timely interventions being in uh, the main board, they were actually in my sideboard. And I'll kind of explain why I think that they should be in the main board, though it does kind of get in the way of four calls I believe in. There weren't many games that I was four calls I believe in for the win, right? Um, but there were matchups where 
I needed a timely intervention later than when I used it, it with Energy Conversion Lab. Try to get it like two times in a row or something like that. But not here nor there. After every game one that I lost, timely interventions went right in. Uh, even in games that I didn't lose in game one, I still put timely interventions in. So if that's the case, I kind of just felt like, you know, just having it in my main board, it's a little bit different from the list that I ran, but this is kind of how I would run it now. And just because again, timely interventions in the main board for me just made more sense. It's more consistent with what I want to do. Yes, four calls I believe in could see some like problems with this. But also, you're not playing four cause I believe, in early. If you are, then you're not in a good spot anyway. You're kind of using it at the end of the game where you're seeing your Dark Saber is probably one used with Sabine or in your um, your resources. Same thing with Timely Intervention. You probably got one of them in the resources, right? Uh, you only have five out of the 50 cards as non-heroic cards, and I still think it's a good percentage with four cause I believe, in if you do need to squeak out a win with that card at the end, right? So that's why I kind of run this way. My sideboard... Very normal, although I do have a Rebel Pathfinder and a Fires for Freedom in there for the matchups that kind of give this deck a little bit of troubles. And again, Sabine is still really good. Doesn't like have like extreme troubles, but there are decks that kind of slow it down. And if you have this aggro deck that gets slowed down by Sentinels, it's a problem. So potentially in these matchups, having the Rebel Pathfinders at three and the Fires of Freedom at three, I think it can be really good uh, with, you know, matchups with Luke and ray red particularly that's kind of what my thought process was right you know have the sideboard with those just so in those matchups you can get those cards and the thing is, is that in my top four matchup i didn't see a single path, rebel pathfinder or fires for freedom which would have really helped with the village protectors which really are kind of the bane of your existence against luke and against ray so it kind of stunk but it is what it is I did make it to the top four even after losing round one. I played the worst top four matchup of my life. I made so many mistakes in game two. It's a little bit embarrassing. You're going to be able to see that on Next Gen Gaming. Uh, feel free to roast me in that video because I do deserve it. It was so, it was so bad. I'm pretty embarrassed with the way that I played in game two. But just to get to the top four, I think, was really good. Especially after losing game one, you pretty much have to win out and, you know, do well from there, right? So now let's go ahead and talk about my matchups and kind of maybe I'll kind of go over what I sideboarded in. Although I did talk about how I did sideboard in pretty much like everything, right? Uh, I mean, timely intervention, something like that. But my first matchup, the one that I lost, though, uh, I do think that this is like almost the exact list. I lost this matchup. It was very interesting. I ended up getting a penalty as well. I got the judge called to me because I accidentally revealed five um, cards off of my uh, four cards I believe in. Uh, I had bought new sleeves that day and they were kind of sticky and I ended up revealing the fifth card and then card manipulation only one penalty point uh, but still in this moment I'm just like nervous nervously playing and kind of just fumbling a lot uh, so game one I ended up losing game two I ended up winning uh, I went to my sideboard added in confiscates in instead of uh, bright hopes uh, mainly just because bright hope the, doesn't really have any Thing to be playing early game right but confiscates i needed it for top target he did heal a ton in round one uh in game one so i decided you know throw in confiscates make sure top target can't be proxed especially with boss so game two came along i made sure i confiscated top target and also ecl out poe against boss so he couldn't double up any of his bounties uh i kind of won that one pretty easily now game three is where things kind of took a turn Mainly because I didn't have Poe in my hand on the boss flip turn. If I did, it would have been completely fine. But it is what it is. Sometimes you just don't have the card, right? Um, you end up... He ends up putting top target down. On that turn, I do have the confiscate in hand. So I pop to, uh, top target again right away. So he cannot double up his heals with boss. But he had another top target in his hand to play it immediately. He then was able to bring out Bosk. Again, no Poe Dameron in hand. I also already used the resource, so even if I did, it would have been mute. And he healed up 12 HP. Following turn, he plays Vigilance. He heals up another 5, so that's 17 HP in two turns against me. And it was still a little bit harder to kind of get around, uh, but I still brought up to 1 HP left on his base, which was still a good showing, but still losing round 1, you're down, you're feeling defeated. It is what it is, and... You know, you kind of hope that you kind of turn things around. But 
again it was good to kind of get this out of the way and i'll kind of explain why in a little bit going into my second matchup i'm not going to really talk about this one that much i'll just bring up my deck list uh in a little bit i'll just bring up my deck list here uh round two was just again because i'm playing also someone else who's 0-1 i just got kind of lucky and playing against uh, a deck that i was really favored playing against so i was able to take that one 2-0 really quickly as well so there is what it is and then again going into round three i went up against a han blue deck right um i'm gonna go over my deck list a little bit more in detail at the end of the video but um because i don't think i talked about it enough i just kind of talked about what i switched from the event but i did go up against a han blue deck now this one's a little bit different than the one that i went up against again i don't know what the lists are like one up against i just think that he didn't have mace windows and he had redemptions instead but play i played against a ton of han blue uh so i have a pretty good understanding of how to go up against it now and it was funny because a lot of the people i talked to in this event i told them i only played wrecker once or i told them i didn't really get to play wrecker i got to play wrecker once and this was the match where i got to play wrecker in right um and everyone was like thinking i was crazy you didn't play wrecker at all all this stuff it's like i just didn't really have an opportunity to or a need to in the times that i did have a chance to at six resources i had better lines that can make me finish out the game rather than just using wrecker uh just to put him on the board right but in this matchup after he played redemption this is game two he used redemption and then was able to um heal his hp back on his base but he did have three damage on his Han Solo. So then I ECL'd out uh, Wrecker. And I was able... Actually, I think he had five damage on his Han Solo. And I did six damage right back to his base. And I was able to take him out, right? But in this matchup, I ended up, again, putting in timely interventions for the possibility of when I did need to use Wrecker with a timely intervention rather than ECL if I had to use ECL a little bit earlier with Poe Dameron, right? So that's kind of what happened there. Again, I just added in my uh timely interventions in this matchup in game four i do believe uh yep game four we had the first mirror match right my well my first and only mirror match right and this one was kind of crazy again i hit up the sideboard after four confiscates and sundari peacekeepers sundari peacekeepers so if i was able to put it down on turn two i was able to restore off some hp to kind of slow down his onslaught right but again timely interventions would not be in the deck at this point right i would be taking out the timely interventions here because i don't need it in the aggro versus aggro matchup uh but it is what it is so we have he gets initiative off the roll and he trounces me he just went faster he got a bunch of things going his way and i got wrecked game two um i thought that there was potential that he had it again but he uses uh four, uh, four calls i believe in and then uh on the turn with four resources no, no, five resources i believe and then he puts rebel uh rebel assault on top of his deck and it puts me in a spot where i have to take initiative at that point because if i don't then he kills me with his sabine and fires for freedom I take initiative. I then go ahead because I have um, Green Squadron A Wing and the Wing Leader on the other side, like in space. He kind of had the ground kind of controlled. But I was able to use ECL with Cassian in hand, taking out his uh, Fleet Lieutenant. And I ended up winning from there. And then in game three, kind of similar. He had initiative. He was kind of cooking. He was about to win. But on the turn with the ECL, I'm mean, at the ECL, uh, Sabine flip, right? If he had flipped Sabine Ren immediately rather than attacking me with his unit, he would have had this game. But I saw that he attacked with his unit, making it so I had a free flip with my Sabine to then put my Darksaber on Sabine freely without it fearing being dead because he could not EC out KTSO and take me out and hit me with um, Sabine and take me out. I would still have one HP left. So I put the Darksaber on it. I swung at the base for seven. I swung at the base for five. He expected me not to take the uh, initiative because he, I still had another unit to swing with, but he didn't have much HP left on his base. I took initiative and he had to swing with Sabine before taking initiative 
because without it, he would have lost. So that was a pretty scary matchup. That was a 2-1 matchup losing the first game. It just got a little bit scary because, if, again, if I lost there, then I probably don't make it in the top eight. But we were able to squeak it out. It was a really good matchup. And the next one I want to kind of talk about because it's it's the Ray Red deck. Now, uh, this is the list that I played against because I did play against Chris, right? So I played against Chris in, um, was it round five or four? Uh, no, I played against him in round five. So we're both three and one going into this matchup. And again, he's like the Sabine, uh, not Sabine, uh, the Ray Red guy, right? Everyone from Atlanta, I don't know if he's from Atlanta, but I know that there's a big group from Atlanta who played this deck or something similar uh, because of Chris. And they all kind of play together. They kind of practice. And he's very good at using the deck. So this was probably one of my harder matchups. Kind of going into it, I knew that it had a pretty decent matchup against me. Again, with the Sentinels being able to slow me down. Him getting into the bigger units, right? Obi-Wan, more Sentinels, then Luke, and then Crate Dragon to kind of finish me off, right? But I was able to win 2-0. And kind of ran away with the games, really. I was able to kind of just get space early, kind of smacking his his base for five with the wing leader with my green squadron A-wing. And then he puts out the sentinel a little bit later, but then I just used the green squadron A-wing to swing into the sentinel. Yes, he can then go ahead and Tarkin Town, which he did my green squadron A-wing. But at that point, I put a K2SO on the board for because he's using his resources to stop space. And then I go ahead and I ship to the ground which is my mindset going up against Ray at all times, which I did not follow in the top four, right? You start in space, and then as they start to put the things that kind of slow you down in space, then you start shifting to the ground. You want to save your ECL for when Ray comes out, although in this matchup, Ray never came out. Uh, both matches were finished before we got to the six resource mark, and it's just so happened that Ray never came out, and wasn't able to help him stabilize because I was able to kind of just put things down and kind of slow him down. But again, a really good matchup. Uh, just ended up taking it too well. And again, Ray just never came out. So I think if Ray came out, it would have been a little bit different, but just never got to that point. The next matchup I had, right, um, going into round six. Now, this was a very sketchy matchup for myself as well. Luke Green is always a matchup that I kind of, not I wouldn't say like super struggled with, but had pretty good matchups against Sabine, right? There's a ton of Sentinels to kind of slow down your opponent. Also having a good amount of Restore in the deck to kind of, again, make it so it's really hard for your opponent to kind of, you know, take control. I don't know if this is the list. I don't know if he played Maz, but either way, Village Protectors, I hate that card, right? There's a reason why I want to go up to one Rebel Pathfinder, or one uh, Fires of Freedom in my sideboard. It's decks like this and Ray, all the Sentinels. It's kind of killer, right? But it's the reason that this deck really like... Also, let's start off with the fact that he rolled a three for initiative and I rolled Snake Eyes. So he still got initiative on game, uh, game one. And that was pretty rough, right? But honestly, in this matchup, what makes Luke so good against Sabine and stuff like that is because... He's able to give shields to his Sentinels, and especially Village Protectors, he's able to get two shields on that when he plays it, and, uh, and there's four resources, and it can become a problem, right? So your main thing is, is like if you have Fires for Freedom or even just Rebel Pathfinders, you're able to hit through the shield and take out the Sentinels, and then your other units are able to kind of continue to swing on the base and kind of keep up the speed. But again, um, game one, dude, he just trounced me. My buddy watched the game, and he thought I was just flat out going to just lose flat out. But I ended up taking game two and kind of the same thing in game three. It's just getting through the village protectors with the extra shields that are kind of annoying. You have to use ECL with Poe. Again, I put timely interventions into my deck. I also put confiscates into my deck to potentially take out shields um, on bigger things if I had to. But still, like the village protectors with two shields using Poe, discarding two cards to make sure you hit the shield and then, you know, if you had two shields, you have to hit two shields off of it to keep up your onslaught. And then I, you know, had K2SO on board and Sabine to keep up the pressure. And I did have some space units as well. But this is one of those matchups that, like, were kind of hard. And you probably didn't see many people running these decks in early planetary qualifiers. They're all running Boba Fett. They're all running Sabine. And now you're starting to see people kind of branch out to play things that kind of counter those decks and kind of go that route, right? And uh, Luke Green, I think, is one of those decks that, you know, could do pretty well. 
in that type of situation, right? But that's my round six. I ended up taking it to one after losing game one. A little bit scary again. But now let's go ahead. We hop into the final matchup, right? I go into a round six and I have to win this match. If I don't win this match, then I end up, again, missing top eight. Just kind of how the percentages went. My first three people that I played against, I'm pretty sure they all dropped after I beat them. So um, actually the first guy I lost to, and then he ended up dropping after losing, I think, in two rounds. So I played against Bosk again in the final round. He was 6-0 and at this point. I play against him in this round. And after playing Bosk in round one and losing to it, I knew my adjustments I had to make. I made a ton of adjustments in how I played against the deck. Although it was the way that I play against the deck normally, I just, again, didn't really, I guess I didn't really have the cards to really progress with my plan at that point. But in this matchup, I was able to do pretty much everything that I wanted to do, right? I won in two games in like 10 minutes and, you know, I finished six and one. Again, I put confiscates from my sideboard into the main board. That's the only change that I made in this matchup, taking out the, um, the Sentinel. But still, a ton of fun. Finished six and one. Proud of the way that I finished, especially after the way that I started. And yeah, we made it into the top cut. I'm going to go ahead and again, show you uh, the standings after round seven. Uh, I was six and one. Uh, my game record was 13 and four. So I only lost four games total in that matchup. The guy in first place only lost three matches total, and I was two of them. So again, like it was really interesting. Um, but then we go into the uh, top eight, which again, I will go ahead and show you here. I went up against, again, in third place, though it doesn't show you exactly what it is, right, in terms of standing. I played the third place team because I came in sixth place, and I played against the Luke Red deck, and I played uh, Sabine Green, which, again, Luke Red does have a pretty good matchup. I'll show you a red. I don't know if this is the exact one, but the reason that this deck has, <clears throat> excuse me, a pretty good matchup into Sabine is because of the Sentinels. It's because of Tarkin Town. So if you get a Sentinel down early, right? And again, uh, he had initiative because he was the higher seed, so he gets initiative first. So Village Protectors getting down with a shield, getting two shields possibly, having me swing into it, using Tarkin Town to get rid of my unit to slow down my aggressive play style is how this deck kind of works really well against my deck, especially because the way that you can go ahead and give shields in a multitude of ways, right? You can... Um, Add shields using Luke's ability. Uh, the Village Protectors, again, I hate that card, gets a shield on entry. The Force is with me. You get the shield there. There's a ton of ways to heal in the deck with Luke, with Razor Crest, with Kanan and the Mill ability. Um, Restored Arc. There's just a ton of ways to heal uh, Yoda as well. So this deck does have a pretty good matchup against me, but I was able to kind of get around it. I did get a little bit lucky. I don't think that he had great draws which does kind of help, but again, I won 2-0 and kind of kept things rolling from there. And then came top four. And again, the top four, I played the worst game of the day in top four. And I admit that uh, thinking back to it, uh, there are a ton of different ways that I would have played that. And it does bother me. But again, to even get to the top four, I think was a pretty good achievement, uh, proving that I do know what I'm doing, right? I think a lot of people think that I'm bad <laughs> at the game or don't know what I'm talking about half the time. But like, you know, this matchup, I in game one, I didn't really just didn't get the draws that I needed. And my opponent played really well and kind of just dismantled me. It is what it is. I just didn't get what I needed. In game two, I started off probably as good as I could have. If I had gotten anything other than Sabine, if I had gotten a three drop on the turn that I used Rebel Assault, I would have been in a much better spot, but I just had Sabine and it just wasn't great. I was hoping for a Fires for Freedom there. If I had dropped the Fires for Freedom there, I think I do win game two because I'm put in a really good spot, right? But neither here nor there. Um, we just ended up making a couple misplays. I ended up ECLing out Poe, which I probably shouldn't have. And even if I did, I probably should have ditched the card and not taken the damage. That is what it is. And then I should have played Wrecker on the turn that I played Fires for Freedom. I was trying to go ahead and get some healing down to the board as soon as possible to kind of 
you know, hit his base and also heal mine to keep me healthy. But he ended up using um, Force Throw, and it really did kind of set me back. So it is what it is. I just made a couple mistakes, a couple misplays. But at that point in the top four, you cannot make any misplays or mistakes. It is what it is, but still had a ton of fun in this event. Shouts to my opponent who beat me in this matchup in top four because he did go off and win the entire event. So again, kudos to him, props to him, great showing. And again, I'm going to go ahead and bring up my deck list and kind of talk about it a little bit more in detail here because again, yes, I ran Sabine. It's a top meta deck. All these things you can say like, oh, you don't deserve it, blah, blah, blah. Fine. But I think that with my play, especially losing in top uh, the first round, in the first game i just i think that i like you have to get around that and i did play against some hard matchups for this deck um not like necessarily hard hard but like harder matchups like you have to play really well and i think i played my butt off in this tournament i think i did really well um the big heroes in this tournament for me right i didn't really get to play wrecker i played wrecker once in the tournament and once in the top four at the wrong time and people were like how are you doing this without playing wrecker i was just doing things a little bit differently uh, to get to the point where even when I had six resources, I wanted to play two other cards in the turn in my certain matchups that I got to that point, right? So I just never played Wrecker, right? Um, timely interventions, again, I would put into my main board after the tournament and kind of take out a couple of metal, metal ceremonies. I've played with it with just one metal ceremony. And when you get the metal ceremony, yes, it feels great. But again, even with one, I, I got it pretty good, right? Um, the big heroes, Wing Leader and K2SO. Two great cards. Obviously, everyone knows K2SO is great. And Wing Leader, surprisingly, just put on the gat. Like, you just go fast with Wing Leader. Prioritizing Wing Leader over Red 3. Again, after playing with Ryan, talking to Ryan, and, you know, you can always put down a Red 3 later on, right? And people want to target it down. But when you get something that has 5 HP, especially on turn 2, it's really hard to deal with right away. So you can almost guarantee that you're going to smack at least five. And in this deck, that's really, really key. Because then next turn, you're going ahead, you're bringing out Sabine and possibly swinging with even just Wing Leader, which is another five on the base potentially. So I do think that prioritizing Wing Leader over Red 3 in this tournament, which is something I discussed with a friend of mine who I was practicing with, did actually make a huge difference. And again, obviously Poe with ECL, really good. And then, yeah, so... I also didn't get to play Darksaber too often. I got to play Darksaber against Sabine. And that might have been like roughly it. I wish that I got Darksaber in against uh, in the top four. I just never got a chance. I never drew it when there was four resources. So it is what it is. Like that would have been fantastic if I could have, but I just didn't. And yeah, I again, I had a ton of fun. Shout outs to Borderlands uh, Comics and Games for the event. It was a lot of fun. I'm going to go ahead and you know, bring up the top eight again, just because, you know, everyone's complaining about how things need to be banned. And I understand. I, you know, you know, maybe an errata and all the stuff like that. But like, once you start doing that, things just kind of take a turn. I think that how things are right now, it just depends on who's playing and what they're playing. If you have people who can play the decks that they bring well, they can beat the likes of Sabine. They can beat Boba Fett and stuff like that. It's just, Again, there are ways to beat these decks. The people making the game didn't make the game to not be able to play against these cards. You just need to be able to play against them, right? So, again, I think that participating in an event like this, only 88 people, but 88 people is still a pretty good size. And then the top eight, the way that it was, right? Boss, Palpatine, Yellow, Luke, you have two Rays and Kira outside of the Sabine and Boba Fett. Like, that's a complete change from the way that it was in week one of the planetary qualifiers that's kind of how it works right you see what people are playing originally and who wins and then you bring things accordingly to beat what beats the meta and that's kind of what you're seeing within week three and probably in week four as well yes boba fett is still winning a lot of these tournaments but in the like in these last like in this last week like you saw a lot of other decks winning so that's just what i wanted to kind of talk about and shout outs to again borderlands comics and games for hosting the event it was a lot of fun and shout out to everyone who played shout out to my buddies who went kind of cheered me on shout out to my friends at home and my wife to kind of keep me even keeled after losing uh round one but with that being said if you guys are new here make sure you hit that uh sub button support is always appreciated and let's go ahead and talk about 
these upcoming giveaways, right? I have my giveaway stream on the 6th. So it's November 6th. I'm going to be opening up a case of Star Wars Unlimited Set 3. I'll be giving away a starter deck and the uh, premium tokens to someone after the first three boxes. And then a, a box and premium tokens after the case is finished. So we're just going to be opening up a case, which we do on after every set release. We just talk about the cards. We talk about how excited we are to play this next uh, set and everything like that. And so I hope to see you guys there. Get a chance to win a box. You know, uh, the last box, the person who won got a Darth Maul hyperspace foil, which is pretty cool. And the one who won in the first set got a showcase. So there are some great pulls to be had, and especially apparently if you win them from this stream coming up. So hope to see you guys there. Also, if you are in the Myrtle Beach area, make sure you stop in if you are around the area around uh, November 1st or November 3rd. 7 o'clock are going to be like our pre-release events um, for set 3. So November 1st, 7 o'clock and November 3rd, 7 o'clock. I'll be there. I'll be playing in both events. I hope to see you guys there as well. It's always a lot of fun. People come in. We just talk Star Wars, play Star Wars. Sealed events, always some of my favorites. I'm going to be making a video coming out uh, later this week about the leaders to potentially try and a little bit of advice going into the pre-releases because again pre-release and sealed are my favorite types of events and i do think i have a pretty good knowledge on how to play them and yeah so without further ado i want to say thank you to all of you for showing your support as always we're gonna be more consistent going further now that the pq is done my wedding's done now we're just going to go ahead and start the grind into set three and you're going to see a lot more videos from me and i hope you guys are excited for that again if you guys are new here hit that sub button support is always appreciated and i'll see you guys next time